Good morning, everybody. Neil McRae here. How are you? Alive? Hooray. Um, so I'm going to talk a bit about infrastructure. It's a bit of a takeaway. It's the next big thing. We don't have a lot of internet things. Um, we certainly have a lot of LLU. We have DNSSEC. We haven't been hijacked. And we've got plenty of white boxes. Hopefully someone won there. Um, I think it's... Uh, the sausage rolls better be coming. Um, ju just, um, we've got a new boss at BT in the last year. I think it's just something worth to point out very briefly. Um, there's a recognition in the business we need to do better on customer service. And every time I come to a meeting like this, I feel it um, quite aggressively. So we're, 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 uh, <laughs> we're, um, we're doing a lot of work on rolling stuff out that works but obviously we supply services to you as operators so we need you to help in that and many of you are um, and, and I just wanted to point that out that you know customer service is a is, is a massive thing for us now we're spending almost as much money on that as I've just spent on the core network so it's pretty significant we've got some other cool things going on fiber which I'm going to talk about TV Champions League next year which would be fantastic and um, mobility can't say much about that um, and then we, we've launched a lot of uh, products in the, the business market, Cloud Voice, and obviously our global network is um, pretty substantial. I'll come on to that very briefly. Um, this is our core network, um, our future architecture. As Tim pointed out, we're one of those horrible carriers with more legacy than we know what to do with, but we are working on it. Last year, we turned off um, one-third of our PDH network, and PDH is in 700,000 boxes, and we turned one-third of it off. We're the only telco in Europe to reduce our power for four years in a row. So we're trying to do uh, the, the environmental thing, not that that wakes me up in the morning. Um, this is our global network. Um, and quite often we see people stand up and say, well, we've got a global network and it's 15 pops. Uh, I've got 1,923. That's a global network. Um, and we serve, as, as you can see from this slide, we serve a lot of places. We do submarine builds in, in other parts of the world. We work with other operators to, to do them. We try and push for NNIs and more Ethernet. The yellow here is where we can supply Ethernet today. Um, and, and pink is where really the only option is uh, Internet access. The rings are where we've got satellite capability. And actually, the reason I mention this is because all these things play into how we approached the build in Scotland. So getting on to that, um, I, I've got a couple of slides from Digital Scotland because it's um, part of this is their project as well as ours and, and that they're um, helping fund it. Um, so the Scottish Government, like all governments, want to be a world-class digital nation. Um, we should have had a buzzword on world-class digital nation. Um, we're aiming to do 85% coverage by the end of uh, this year and we're on track for that. And 95% um, in 2017. Every 1% gets a lot harder because it's a guy in a field or up a mountain or at the end of a canal, um, and running fibre or connectivity to them becomes very difficult. Um, it's £410 million of investment, um, which is pretty significant. So what are we doing? Um, many of these places are fantastic holiday locations, so if you haven't been to any of them, I, I encourage you to do so. They're beautiful locations, and I'll, I'll show a little bit about that. Um, but we're rolling out fibre to the, where the average speed is about one meg um, bandwidth. So suddenly you've got one meg, and then after we roll our fibre out, you've got 80. And for that, it's pretty life-changing for these people. I mean, when, if, for those of you that were in Belfast, um, I talked about the same thing in, in Belfast, where we've made a tremendous difference to communities and to, um, to business. Um, at the end of, end of this, though, you know, you look at the number of homes passed. So we're currently at 21 million homes passed. Um, and, and we're spending a lot of money to get, up, you know, roughly about 100 to 200,000 homes passed. But it's important for those communities. It's important for us as a country to do that. And, and part of our strategy in BT is to use uh, communications as a, as a future, as, as, sorry, as a power for, for good. Um, so about the build itself. We started the process in November, um, and, and that was actually quite challenging because, I don't know if people know this, there used to be huge fleets of cable system ships. CNW had one, BT had some, um, loads of, you know, AT&T had them, all the big kind of PTTs had uh, cable ships, a couple of other uh, random companies had them as well. 
and over time they've all kind of been bought, sold and chopped around. And one of the few um, PTTs that still is quite strong in this area is Orange, and that's who we worked with, Orange Marine. Um, and we worked with them on the actual lay. We also worked with two British companies, um, Global Marine Systems, who um, I think have done quite a lot, um, both with BT and CNW when I was there, and uh, A to C, who, who um, kind of did the, the onshoring of the, of the cable. Um, one of the, the really big challenges in this was public consultation. Um, so quite often cables are laid, they're power cables and they're high voltage power cables. So you've got a huge amount of health and safety of, you know, get some guy with a fishing rod um, giving himself a haircut. You, you've got to, you know, there's a lot of focus from the local authorities to ensure that what we deploy is safe. Actually, in this case, most of our cables, sorry, actually all of the cables we deployed are passive. So typically in submarine systems, particularly long distance ones, they're high voltage cables because you need to power the repeaters. Um, there is no requirement for repeaters, so all these cables are effectively just dark fibre bundles um, that we bury in the sea, and I'll, I'll, I'll come on to that in a minute. Um, <clears throat> actually, making the cable, this, you know, you, it's not like you can walk into PC World and buy some submarine cable, so you've got you to gotta order it, and, and again, there's not many, cap not many companies that build this stuff, so you've kind of got to get your slot on their conveyor belt. And then we had three um, vessels roll out, and between June and November, uh, we rolled out 250 miles of just the subsea part of that. Um, I've worked in, in some subsea elements and never achieved anything like that, and I think you know, my hat's off to the guys who we work with and my subsea team for, for, for building that so quickly. Um, and obviously, we had a, you know, the BDUK stuff that we're doing has a lot of deadlines in it, so um, it was important that we nailed it quickly. We also had to deal with, uh, with wildlife concerns, um, no otters were damaged in the process of laying this cable. Um, we, we also have to deal with fishermen. Um, no fishermen were shot in the process of this. Um, but, you know, they have, they have legitimate concerns because if you look at, you know, Suez, for example, um, a, lot of, a lot of cables damaged in that region because people drag things along the base, and this is quite shallow water. Um, and there's no point in us building something if every, every other month we have to go fix it. So... Um, working with them, we got, we got to a reasonable answer. Um, this is just a few pictures of, of um, the build. So the, the cable ship that, that was used in this, the big cable ship, was uh, a ship called René Descartes. Um, it's a, it's, I think it's the biggest cable ship in the world now. Um, it's pretty substantial. It can pull 125 tonnes. Um, and if you're in, if you anyone here owns a yacht, where is Graham? He's not here. Um, that the, um, that, that's a pretty substantial amount of power. Um, and and the, the big challenge around this is, is as you can see from the, this map, um, some of these areas are a bit precariously tight in terms of manoeuvring. So a lot of local pilots were used to kind of navigate the, the, the waters as the cable was deployed. You can see the 20 locations. These are actually more aligned to BT exchanges than locations as to where we built the... Um, the, the cables. But, you know, none of this is relatively easy. Um, the longest route, I think, was 50 miles. Um, and, and to be honest with you, there's probably more we need to do at some point in time, so we'll, there's some stuff that we'll go back and do. Um, there was one other ish, small issue that you might have read about in, in, in the press. Um, what you see there is a plough. Um, I think it's about four tonnes, and it's worth about four million quid. Unfortunately, during the build, the plough got stuck and, it, and the cable connecting it to the boat snapped, and there was a bit of a panic because it was in relatively low waters. Um, it's something that happens rarely, but what, what it reinforced for us is there's a lot of surveying you have to do before you build this. What kind of, what kind of, what's the seabed like? What am I digging into? What's the, the, the soil like? What's the sediment like? Um, I think we got it on that. We got it mostly right, probably apart from this one area where it was a lot soft, softer than we expected. The good news is, that, again, the guys at Orange Marine did a fantastic job. The, the bottom um, picture is a, a remotely a remote control submarine thing that's very, you know, it, it, it can actually lay cable as well. So whilst the plough was stuck, um, actually the build went on. Orange Marine uh, cracked on and got it done. They later recovered the plough using one of those vehicles um, afterwards. But, again, the plough is a pretty significant investment. If you Google it, you'll see so there's, I think, two companies that make them. And, again, they're built to order. So if you lose one, you know, you probably get it back the year, a year later. Um, but we're able to recover it. And, largely, that was, uh, you know, that was the only kind of war story. Um, it was a bit funny when someone phoned me up and said that they'd lost the plough. 
and I said, it's a pretty big thing to lose. Um, <laughs> but, um, and, and again, we had, to, you know, the, the, the thing I have to stress on this, and I, I'm, I wasn't particularly close to the time of Bill, but um, feedback was the local community really embraced because they, they see the benefit of this um, for, for them and, and for uh, wider industry. Um, so how do we plug it into the rest of the BT network? Um, so we didn't just build uh, submarine systems. We actually also had to build a lot of optical fibre around Scotland, um, roughly about 500 miles of it. Um, so if you look here, our existing uh, WD ne WDM network is in the blue. Um, we built all the green stuff, um, and we, we use a Sienna 6500 uh, platform. Um, we've got 100 gig in at the moment, 10 by 10. Um, you know, which, which given the volumes here is, is, is probably more than we'll need for, for a, at least a couple of years until 8K TV comes out. But um, the, the in, ensuring we're able to bring this connectivity back, make it redundant, because largely um, most of these locations, when the cable goes, it's game over. So we've added redundancy into places like Stornoway um, and some of the other islands as well which I think is, is, is really important um, for those communities. It's going to be reliable. Um, I read a, a, a post in one of the uh, kind of Hebrides news about one guy telling um, a friend of his that worked in California that he had 80 meg, which was more than the guy in California could get. Um, so I, when I look at that, it, you know, it's, it's, a, it's a big win for us. Um, again, this part of our, our core network, we run it as one platform. Um, here, the red dots are our metro core nodes, um, which I think in Scotland we've got about nine, and there's 106 in total. Um, again, I, I, you know, it's obvious, hooray, we've got fast broadband. Um, everyone remembers what that was like in this room. Probably some might not have experienced it yet, but it's coming soon. Um, and, and, you know, for the local communities, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's tremendous. If you think, those of you that have got kids and they play Xboxes, you know, in these islands, they've never been able to play online. It just hasn't worked. Those of you that watch Netflix, they've never really been able to watch Netflix. So it's all, all of a sudden you've got this pent-up demand of content and, and capability that they want. Um, this is where it's available. Again, we, you know, in, in BT and OpenReach, we've got more work to do to roll out cabinets, and we're working through that. We've got a bunch of stuff to do this year to complete phase one, and then phase two is uh, 2017, and then I suspect there'll probably be a phase three of some description. Um, and that's my presentation. Would you like any questions to be answered? Mike. There was one question from the IRC room. Yep. Uh, Shall I start as I've got a mic? Go for it, Will. Um, I wondered if... No. <laughs> no? Okay, no. <laughs> uh, Will from Lonap. Um, I wondered if, um, since you said these cables are all passive, um, you know, normally if you get some abrasion on the cable or something like that, I believe the most common cause is shunt faults yep. of the power supply. Does, um, of the cable. Does that mean if you get abrasion on the cable, you don't necessarily notice? Is there, is there a kind of longer term no, problem? Yeah, it's a good question. So, so we've actually deployed some capability and to do more. I mean, that was actually, that was one of the holdups of, of deploying, was coming up with a system that gave us good visibility of what was going on in the cable. Um, we've deployed something that's, that's um, it's something similar that we're actually we're looking to do on passive networks elsewhere that allows us to, to kind of get a, a, almost a power um, ratio from it and, and we monitor that closely but it is one of the concerns that we had in doing this by making them passive how do we track faults the, the problem is is to make them electrical it would just be super yes, money so. basically and it, you, you'd never do it and it certainly seems to be the trend among any yeah. short span cable yeah. if you can make it passive you do absolutely and, and the, you know it's not like a you know a bit of FCPC in a node, it's proper armoured Axions cable, again Google them, they were very good as well I have to say, um, at manufacturing the cable. Thanks. Javid. Hi Javid from Netflix. Hi um, Javid. Hi. Um, question, um, the user in Scotland with um, fast fibre broadband, how much latency can they expect to the wider internet? Yeah, I mean it's the speed of light through fibre plus some buffers. You know, so we all know what that is. External connectivity is all. So, so I think if I go back to this, um, our network, so from any metro core site, any square, 
we have a 100 gig link down to London. So it's kind of single hop to, to exchange points. So, you, so you're going to see probably 30, 35 milliseconds, that sort of order. Right. Okay, thank you. RTT, of course. Okay, and then Paul? Yeah, I'm uh, just uh, curious about uh, how much this all cost what the uh, payback time is, or is it going to be uh, kind of written off in the long run, and how much it's going to cost to keep, ex keep it running and expanded? Yeah, actually, uh, the, the running costs, we expect, you know, we've made an assessment on that, but it's kind of like an insurance policy. How often do you crash your car? So how often are we going to get, a, uh, you know, a damage to the cable? In terms of the overall cost, it was roughly just under £30 million to build the, the submarine part. The rest of it, I, I don't have a figure off the top of my head, but... 410 million is what's been invested in this program uh, across Scotland. Um, in the north of Scotland, we're paying, uh, I think BT is the public numbers, I don't know them exactly, but it's about, I think we contribute about 40 million. In the south of Scotland, I think we're contributing about 112 million or something like that. Um, so it's big, big money, but you, you, know, you can't build this sort of stuff unless you, you invest. And, and as, as, as infrastructure providers, we need to invest. Um, depends on the take up. So CPs, you can all sell this. Please sell as much of it as you can so we can pay it back and invest in the next run. Okay, uh, Remco. Morning. Thanks, hi, Remco. That was excellent. Um, Remco, hi. Um, <laughs> <laughs> who are you? Are you, um, the, are you the next big thing? No, I'm not. Well, I... I'm, 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 my head is in the clouds right now. I'm looking at outsourcing. <laughs> you hijacking this presentation? Um, no, only, I'm not. It only counts if the speaker says it. Oh, uh, <laughs> so, sorry, guys. I tried. Um, so, a uh, question about the um, the, uh, the submarine cables that you're using. Given that they're all passive systems, did that impact the number of fibre strands you put into those cables? Uh, yes, yeah, good question. So, we put 48 strands in, um, except in a couple of locations, we put 96 more for diversity. So, it affected in that because we don't need to do uh, regeneration or repeating, we yeah. can put as much as, we, largely as much as we like. The typical, you know, so it would have been 96 or 144. Mm -hmm. 96 seem reasonable. So you effectively made them part of your terrestrial DWM system? Yeah, yeah and, we, and we aligned it with what we do elsewhere in the network. Yeah. So there's no point in doing something special there if it's no. different somewhere else. So, right, thanks. Yeah. Crikey, it's exciting, all these questions. Just a quick question. So can anybody else get access to these 96 fiber pairs? Um, you can buy OpenReach EAD, EBD. Um, you can buy our optical plat products. You can buy Ethernet. You can buy GEA. Um, in fact, we have more products than anyone else in the world. And you're welcome to buy them. And, and, and they're all superb. I am sponsoring some in another, in another manner. There are... Um, some, some uh, other new exciting products coming and I think today we announced some new pricing on EAD so um, you know we're super competitive and great value for money. <laughs> Donal from Airspeed Telecom, two questions. First of all, how deep did you have to bury the cable with the aforementioned plow? Um, yeah, it varies. So um, we're, we're in the meters mark because pr predominantly because it's shallow water and there's a lot of fishing. So you, we, had, we, we, decided, we actually, from a, a planning point of view, we didn't have to, but we decided to because we don't want to be digging it up all the time. Um, but it's very varied. In some areas, again, because of where you're coming off from the landing, we decided to go a lot deeper and, and come up a bit. But um, we're into, I think it's something between, I think the, the deepest was eight meters, I think. Uh, the second question was just having seen some of the submarine cables that have to be used um, for things where you're burying down on the ocean floor, um, given some of the depths, were you able to use different submarine cable compared to um, what would have to be used in the deep blue? So, we, so we're not electrifying it. So that's that's one thing we didn't have to do. But it, it's typical. It's it's armored submarine fiber without the electrification. So um, it's slightly different, but not massively different. I think the, 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 probably the big tension is back to the point I think Will made. The, the, the submarine cables tend to, um, they're like a bit like a bit elasticy. Um, we decided just to put that in, not because, not because we had to, but because there was no benefit in not doing it, and largely the cost was the same. Um, I mean, the big challenge, the, the, I think the big challenge we've got is, is the, the biggest challenge in it, in, in my mind, was we had to use quite a big boat 
to do this because there isn't a small such a thing as a small cable ship. So when you, when, you know, and a lot of people are asking, why the hell have you guys got such a big boat? And it's like because that's the only one that's there really. Um, there are some other smaller vehicles in the ROM, but but you you large, you know, this this cable weighs a few tons. It's not it's not something you can turn up in an open reach van. You've got to you've got to kind of have a have a proper ship to tow it along and and, and deploy it. Thank you. So um, actually, just on this slide, before I go, um, I'm also part of the programme committee and, and the guys here do a great job, but always exciting to know what you'd like to see us present from BT. So here's some ideas. If you tweet me, I'm at Neil McRae and we'll, we'll listen to it and, and come up with something that's exciting for you. Um, thanks very much. It's been okay, a pleasure. Thank you, Neil.